In professional wrestling, and more specifically the WWE, one of the most dry and downright damaging periods is known as the Reign of Terror. A time frame between 2002 and 2005 where Monday Night Raw was basically the Triple H show. He'd be littered throughout the show in multiple segments, oftentimes would start off Raw with a promo that didn't really add any value to ongoing storylines and was just filler. And the worst part was that he would defeat opponents when the other person should have came out on top. The Reign of Terror was one which Triple H had a stranglehold on the World Heavyweight Championship and it's seen as a period where people just switched off from watching Raw. But was it really that bad? Well lucky for you I strapped my nipples to the horse like Dolph Ziggler in Silent Library and I tortured myself by watching every single match, every single segment and the entire Reign of Terror. Do not do this unless you want to torture yourself, you have this video. You know, as a kid, I was watching this and I thought that Triple H was just really good, that's why he always won. And now that I'm a little bit older, I understand the other side of wrestling and well, let's just say that I never want to hear Motorhead ever again. We begin this story in the year 2002 where Triple H returned from a quad injury. By summer of that year, he became the number one contender for the undisputed WWE title held by Brock Lesnar. Only issue is that Brock Lesnar signed a deal to become exclusive to SmackDown, so Raw was left without a world title. And Raw GM Eric Bischoff just went, yo, screw it, I'm just gonna hand it over to the number one contender, no tournament, no big match, nothing. And so, Triple H was awarded the World Heavyweight title and the reign of terror had begun. On that night, Ric Flair came out yelling at Triple H about how he didn't earn it and Triple H laid out Ric Flair. So we were all thinking that maybe we were going to get a program between these two, but boy were we ever wrong. On the first episode with Triple H as world champion, he was in four different segments throughout the show and this becomes a theme throughout this video is the overuse of Triple H. I'm pretty sure if you looked at a raw creative meeting between 2002 and 2004, it would literally just say Triple H on the script. Triple H's first challenger was RVD, who was a fan favorite. He was young, exciting, high flying, he had everything. He won a fatal 4 way match involving Jeff Hardy, Big Show and Chris Jericho to face Triple H at Unforgiven. That match came and a lot of people were hoping RVD would win, but that didn't happen. Just as it looked like Ric Flair was about to screw over Triple H after being humiliated by him, Ric Flair aligned with the World Heavyweight Champion. This is an alliance that we'd see for the next few years. Ric Flair was out here telling people that Triple H was the greatest of all time, that this man possessed everything needed in a world champion. He was saying that Triple H was the new Ric Flair. After he was done with RVD, next up for Triple H was Kane and brace yourself cause you guys knew this was coming. One of the worst and downright stupid angles in wrestling history the Katie Vick storyline. Triple H came out telling us that 10 years ago Kane killed someone named Katie Vick. That Kane was a murderer. But who was Katie? Kane told us that Katie was just a friend and Triple H went no she's not and he asked Kane did you do it to her while she was alive or when she was dead? What was he talking about? Well, Katie and Kane had gotten drunk at a party and what happened after was a complete accident. Triple H was saying that this wasn't an accident and that Kane was evil and he was demonic and at no mercy, he would ruin Kane's life and take away his intercontinental championship in a winner take all match. And at that event, Triple H retained his world title but this feud wasn't over yet. The next night on Raw, Triple H said that he had video evidence of Kane having intercourse with Katie Vick. So later in the night, Triple H shows a videotape of him butt naked in a thong, wearing a Kane mask, having sexual intercourse with a doll at a funeral home. He gets in the casket and he reenacts what Kane apparently did to Katie and at the end of it he's like, wow, I really did fuck your brains out. bro." Whose idea was it to run this? Making love to a dead person, you know, a, a female dead person when you're a guy is, and you're in this thong type thing, it was like, that is like high comedy if there ever is. Next week, Triple H came out and he was talking to mannequin Katie Vick and she was telling him that Kane had a small D. Hurricane was out here showing footage of Triple H having a sledgehammer removed from his ass. 
It was just wild. At the end of that night's Raw, it was a casket match between Triple H and Kane, and out of the casket came a returning Shawn Michaels to continue his feud with Triple H. For those that don't know, Triple H and Shawn Michaels were having a blood feud heading into SummerSlam 2002 after Shawn Michaels returned from a back injury. And it was at this point in 2002 where WWE began the build for the first ever Elimination Chamber. It would be the world champion Triple H defending his title against Kane, Chris Jericho, Booker T, RVD, and Shawn Michaels. Shawn Michaels took the win and the redemption story for him was complete. Who did he pin? It was Triple H. What a noble man, putting over his best friend. Shawn Michaels held the title for about a month, defending it against RVD before facing Triple H at Armageddon 2002. This match was a three stages of hell match, and at the end of the night, it was Triple H who would come out on top. It was around this time where the recruitment process began for Triple H and Ric Flair for the group that would eventually be known as Evolution. Ric Flair was scouting Batista and telling him that he possessed everything to be the best in the business. For Triple H, he was continuing his crusade against former WCW guys. The next one for him was Big Papa Pump Scott Steiner. These guys were out here doing pose downs, push up contests, arm wrestling matches, just trying to one up each other and prove who the better man truly was. This was when there was a bidding war going on for Scott Steiner and how Raw attracted him to their brand was they promised him a world title match against Triple H. He got this match at Royal Rumble 2003 and when I say this match is garbage, I mean it. This match is garbage. They had the monster that was Scott Steiner and they put him in a match with Triple H while he was injured. Triple H retained and a small time later on the January 20th 2003 episode of Raw we were introduced to Evolution, Triple H's version of the Four Horsemen. You had Ric Flair, the legend of the past, Triple H, the star of today, and Randy Orton and Batista, the future of the WWE, a group destined for success. For Triple H, he was destined to meet Scott Steiner again at No Way Out, where Triple H took the win once again. Now it was WrestleMania season, and we had yet another infamous angle. You see, there was this guy named Booker T who was a former 5 time WCW champion, one of the best superstars to come out of the invasion angle, and he won a battle royal to face Triple H at Wrestlemania for the world heavyweight title. The whole story was about Booker T fighting from the bottom and earning his way to the top, a guy who was in jail, but he would put the past behind him and go from rags to riches. But what ended up happening instead was this storyline took a downright racist turn. Triple H was telling Booker T that someone like you doesn't belong here. He was insinuating that a person of color like Booker T wasn't someone who belonged at the top of WWE. He was only here to entertain the masses. You had Triple H and Ric Flair telling Booker T to be their slave and that he was only here to crack jokes and make them laugh. So we were heading into WrestleMania 19 and the guy had just been humiliated, but we'd gotten to know him a lot. So logic would have suggested that Booker T would have overcame the villain Triple H and won the title. But Booker T lost after Triple H hit a pedigree and legitimately it felt like he took about 4 hours to pin him. This is a controversial one and one which almost everyone unanimously says that yes, Booker should have won this. They basically built this up as Booker, you're not deserving of being here and they played the race card only for him to go on and lose. Did Booker T recover after this? Yeah, he did. But the problem with a lot of this reign is that guys who should have won at certain points didn't. And I'm sure you guys are aware that there's times in pro wrestling where if you don't win when you're supposed to, you never recover. Speaking of recovery, we had Kevin Nash recover from his quad injury and he was back in the WWE, only to find out that his two best friends were caught in a heated feud. So he had to choose, either he would side with Triple H or Shawn Michaels. And Triple H decided that he was sick of the crap and he made the decision for Nash by hitting him with a low blow. This led to a 6 man tag team match at Backlash, and at the end of it, it was Kevin Nash getting pinned by Triple H. And from here, Kevin Nash was on a mission to kill Triple H. They were brawling on the streets, Triple H was stealing trucks, and someone at the end of this would have their judgement day. At that event, Triple H retained his title by DQ, and a rematch followed at Bad Blood 2003. This time, 
The thing was that not a single ref on Raw wanted to officiate this match because they thought it was dangerous being in the ring with Triple H. So Mick Foley was named guest ref and Triple H retained the world title. Alright, nothing too controversial going on here, you know, he's not banging dolls or being racist, but something big was coming. One of the biggest moments in Raw history. But before we get there, Randy Orton made his return to the WWE after an injury and three-fourths of Evolution was back together with Batista still injured. With Batista injured, Triple H decided to try to recruit Kane to join Evolution, but Kane went, nah, I'm not doing that. He had his sights set on the World Heavyweight title and we got a mask versus title match. If Kane won, he'd be world champion. If Kane lost, he'd be forced to unmask. And it was the latter which ended up happening. Kane was forced to unmask and showed his face to the entire world. And Kane went off after this. He was burning JR, hitting Linda with tombstones, and just creating hell on earth. That was twice in a matter of year where WWE did something weird with Kane. Two times where probably he should have won the world title, but he didn't. And this comes back to the damage I was talking about earlier. Sometimes the obvious decision is the best one. You guys know that Grim Reaper knocking on the door meme? Well, that was basically Triple H in this time frame, killing everyone from WCW. But that door would open again, and this time it was Goldberg's turn. Goldberg had debuted after WrestleMania, and he was tearing through everyone, and himself and Triple H were on a collision course for SummerSlam 03 in a singles match. But Triple H suffered a groin injury and instead of the match being one on one, WWE decided that they wanted Triple H to wrestle so they changed it to an elimination chamber match so that Triple H would have to do minimal movements. This was where Triple H was wearing the biker shorts and obviously now that he was injured it would be a perfect time to drop the title. Come SummerSlam 2003, it's Goldberg and Triple H as the last two and somehow, some way after a sledgehammer shot. Triple H retained the world title. You guys see how repetitive these match finishes are? Interference, DQ, pedigree, extremely long interval between pedigree and cover. It was a rinse and repeat cycle and a huge criticism of this time frame was the lackluster matches. After Goldberg lost at SummerSlam, the two men met again at Unforgiven. This time, Goldberg took the win, which kinda made no sense. Like, you could've just had him win at SummerSlam. But there it was, Goldberg was world champion and now a bounty was placed on his head. See, Triple H was injured so WWE decided that we won't have him compete, instead we'll run a storyline where Triple H puts a $100,000 bounty on Goldberg's head. So you had dudes trying to run down Goldberg with cars, but the person who claimed the bounty would be a returning Batista and Evolution was now complete. After suffering a loss to Goldberg at Survivor Series 03, Evolution ended Armageddon with all the raw gold. Batista and Flair were the tag champions, Randy Orton was the IC champion, and Triple H captured his third World Heavyweight Championship in just over a year. It was circle back season for WWE now, and they went back to the Michaels and Triple H feud for Royal Rumble 2004. Both dudes just had a full on bloodbath in a last man standing match. The match ended in a draw and both men were stretchered out of the arena. Definitely check this one out if you haven't. On the same night, Chris Benoit won the Raw Rumble and he was on SmackDown so you'd think that he would go challenge for the WWE title. But he made his way over to Raw and it looked like we were going to get Triple H versus Chris Benoit at WrestleMania for the world title. But before Daniel Bryan was out here making matches triple threats, it was Shawn Michaels who kicked Benoit in the face and signed the contract for WrestleMania 20. In his mind, he was the rightful number one contender because he didn't lose to Triple H. So Mania 20 comes and these three put on one of the best WrestleMania matches ever and it ends with Error 404 making Triple H tap out and becoming the World Heavyweight Champion. Chris Benoit and Eddie Guerrero celebrate and they're ushering in a new era. Following WrestleMania 20, Triple H was drafted to SmackDown but he got traded back to Raw for Bubba, Devon and Booker T. Now Triple H was the only member in Evolution without a championship so he came out demanding to be put in the upcoming world title match at Backlash. So we were getting HBK vs Chris Benoit vs Triple H at Backlash. It was during this time where Triple H put over Shelton Benjamin in the main event of Raw 
and then again by count out the next week. And now Evolution was showing cracks. Triple H lost a Backlash, Batista and Flair lost their tag team titles to Edge and Benoit, and it wasn't looking good. We had Triple H leave the world title scene and we pivoted back to Shawn Michaels versus Triple H one more time. These two were trying to kill each other, Shawn Michaels was out here getting suspended, and instead it was Kane challenging for the world heavyweight title even though Triple H was still main eventing. This is around the time where we got our introduction to Eugene. Who is Eugene you might ask? Well he was the special needs nephew of Raw GM Eric Bischoff. And who was Eugene's favorite wrestler? It was Triple H. So this dirty mastermind decided that he should take advantage of the disadvantaged and he tried to use Eugene. Yo, what the fuck was going on on Raw during this time? These guys were playing musical chairs to determine title contenders. Eugene though went on to cost Triple H the world title at Vengeance and again during a 60 minute Iron Man match on Raw. So for SummerSlam, we had Triple H taking on Eugene where Triple H ended up winning. It was on that same night where Evolution member Randy Orton was taking on Benoit for the world title and Randy took the win and became the youngest world champion in history. And the breakup of Evolution was underway. Thumbs up, thumbs down and Randy Orton was kicked out of Evolution. Triple H wanted the world heavyweight title but Orton just spat in his face and refused to give it back to him. And we got babyface Randy Orton. The two met at Unforgiven 2004 and Triple H ended Randy Orton's first world title reign. At Taboo Tuesday, Triple H had a successful defense against Shawn Michaels. Yo, you would swear this is Vince McMahon's creative plan at this time. And from here, it was Team Orton versus Team Triple H at Survivor Series, the winning team being able to be Raw GM for one show each. It was early November where we got our first glimpse of an upcoming feud between Batista and Triple H. Triple H leaves the locker room and Batista looks at the world title, signaling that he wanted what Triple H had. At Survivor Series though, Team Orton won with Randy Orton being the sole survivor. So Triple H was out here getting pissed and telling Batista that he was basically useless and not as good as he thought he was. Telling Batista that he had a million dollar body and a 10 cent brain. He was threatening to replace him in evolution and then you had Ric Flair just trying to play peacemaker. Batista was laying out Triple H in the locker room but they were swerving us. Maybe Triple H thought that they were going too quick with this feud and they wanted to just let it burn slowly. On Raw, the main event was Triple H, Edge and Chris Benoit for the World Heavyweight title where Benoit tapped out Edge while his shoulders were pinned at the same time. So the world title was declared vacant and Triple H was out here crying and begging, looking as red as a tomato, begging for his world title back. I am uh, the game. And tonight, you will see me play my game. Like bro, just shut the fuck up. We don't want to hear you. During that time, we still sowed in seeds between Batista and Triple H. So Eric Bischoff decided that the vacant world title would be decided in an elimination chamber match at New Year's Revolution. Yo, you guys talk about Charlotte stat padding or this guy stat padding, Roman stat padding. Triple H is the inventor of stat padding. At New Year's Revolution, Triple H pinned Randy Orton to win his fifth world title in four years. Why do you guys think that Triple H has the record for most Elimination Chamber wins? This dude was almost undefeatable in those. But fear not, this reign is coming to an end. Randy Orton was out here snaking out Triple H, casting doubt in Batista's mind that he was being used and Batista slowly started to turn on Triple H. And the reactions for Batista started to get louder. Triple H was costing Batista matches and telling him not to enter the Royal Rumble because he wanted to save his world title. But Batista went, I like the idea of a Royal Rumble, so he entered it. So we come to Royal Rumble and Triple H retains his world title burying babyface Randy Orton. And at the end of the night, there were two people left in the 2005 Royal Rumble, Batista and John Cena. Two bona fide top tier stars for WWE in the immediate future. Cena and Batista both land at the same time, Vince comes out, tears both quads and we restart the match. 
and Batista ends up winning. The story from here was where will Batista go? Will he go to SmackDown or will he stay on Raw? Triple H was trying to get Batista ran over by a limousine pretending he was JBL, but Batista caught Triple H in the act. And then we got to that iconic moment in February, the thumbs up, thumbs down, and Batista lays out Ric Flair and Triple H. He's going to WrestleMania 21 and he's challenging Triple H for the World Heavyweight Championship. And at Mania 21, in the main events after a pretty whatever match, Batista had done it. He was the new World Heavyweight Champion and the future generation was in full swing. Batista beat Triple H again at Vengeance and Backlash and the reign of terror was officially over. Sure, Triple H had reigns here and there, but nothing was as bad as this stretch from 2002 to 2005. So was it really that bad? It was. It was really bad. I think I read somewhere that Vince McMahon saw that the Raw brand wasn't doing so hot, so he sent Pat Patterson on like a fact-finding mission and he came back to Vince and he was just like, yo, it's, it's Triple H. He's not that big of a draw. People think he's boring. If you look at this reign in retrospect, the glaring issue is the stunting of people's momentum at Triple H's expense. Like Goldberg, for example. Him winning was cool, but why didn't he just win a month earlier? Booker T, he should have won. Kane, that one's arguable, but you could say that he should have won. It was these guys' time, but they just didn't get it. It was also this weird thing where he was like, haha, I'm on the booking team. Austin's gone. Rock's gone. This is my show now. The formulaic 20 minute promos were absolutely abysmal. It's just shady if you really look at it. There's so much politics to uncover behind what was truly happening. Smackdown was out here flourishing while Raw was a rinse and repeat pattern with Triple H. It was actually terrible. The good thing to come out of this reign of terror was we got a good feud between HBK and Triple H, Orton's initial emergence, and of course the big rub that Batista and later John Cena would get. I tortured myself by watching every segment, every match. Drop a like for all the pain that I endured to make this video. But I want to hear from you guys. Do you guys think the Reign of Terror was good or bad? I can without a doubt, after watching it, feeling that pain for a second time in my life, give it a big fat bad. Drop some requests of what you'd like to see in the next good or bad. Do take very good care of yourself. Peace.